No credit for the title of this. Uh, I think Michael Clare devised this title to make it more appealing. Uh, my this this sort of presentation is uh, somewhat based on my PhD, which I did at Edinburgh, that looked at maritime union in this period, 1969 to 1980. And even though I'm a political scientist, I've focused very much on history because I think that the history can tell us a lot, a great deal about. Uh, things today. And I think this period in which uh, the maritime provinces, um, Newfoundland as well was sort of in there, can tell us a lot about cooperation today uh, in terms of has anything actually changed? Have we actually moved forward at all? Because within this period, 1960 to 1980, was when it all sort of happened. Um, you had the Atlantic Premier's Conference formed in 1956, which was ongoing into the 1960s. But then you had, as I was talking about, uh, the Maritime Union study proposed by Louis Robichaud in 1964 that began in 1968 and published in 1970. The Council of Maritime Premiers was, came in off the back of that in 1972. So it was a really sort of key period uh, for cooperation. And then I, I often ask myself the, the question of, has it actually progressed since then? Where, where are we sort of since then? So I think about that and I'll, I'll look at perhaps other other parts of Canada as well, Western Canada in particular. I'm interested in Western Canada. I'd like to do some research on that because they formed the Western Premiers Conference in 1971, sort of off the back of what the Maritimes are doing. Um, Fred Drummy, who led a former uh, economic advisor to Robert Show, who led the Maritime Union study, was going out to the West and speaking about cooperation. But in many ways, uh, the West is sort of overtaking the Maritimes in Atlantic Canada now in what they're doing. So I'll, I'll consider a bit of that. So my main objectives are consider some of the history, consider some of the forces that encourage, uh, some of the, the forces that discourage. And I've put determine a realistic and achievable way forward. I'm not entirely sure whether I'm going to give it a, a way forward. But um, I'm certainly going to think about some of the contemporary things and think about whether this actually sort of points a way forward for us. So. Within my PhD, um, I sort of broadly brought out that the impetus for cooperation is both internal and external. And when I mean internal, it means so coming from within provinces themselves, within the premiers, um, and external, uh, that could be either outside the region, maybe even outside of Canada. Um, and I thought it, this idea of internal dynamics, political environment at the time, so the internal dynamics in the 1960s, you had the premiers, these quite distinct premiers coming through. You had Robert Stanfield in Nova Scotia, Louis Robichaud, and eventually Alec Campbell in PEI, who were willing uh, to consider these kind of questions of, of cooperation. So uh, quite a unique environment at that time, and they all sort of coalesced. They were all young. Uh, Bob Stanfield was a, bit, uh, a little bit older, uh, and going forward, the uh, after 1970, the premiers, Richard Hatfield, Alec Campbell, Gerald Regan, all from Dow Law School, um, all in and around the same age, all thinking somewhat along the same lines despite parties. And let's talk about agency. And what I mean by this is their willingness and their cap actual capacity to act. So they may actually favor cooperation, but the context of the time actually means they, they, they can't. They can't consider it or they... they they're unable to consider it. So PEI is, is uh, one of the main examples. Alec Campbell at that time was able to consider cooperation at a time when others perhaps weren't able to. Uh, political will. I think political will is one of the key variables. You actually have to see, see the value of cooperation in order to engage with it. And internal and external pressure. Really big. Um, in the uh, 1960s, this idea of province building coming through, the bureaucratization of the provinces when you had uh, bureaucrats coming through and public advisors who themselves saw the value of cooperation and were pushing the premiers into some kind of response. And external pressure, federal government or the rest of Canada. Federal government, um, as I'll talk about, uh, the rest of Canada would love to see a maritime union. Um, when it came up recently, a year ago, the Globe and Mail was all over it. 
this would be a great idea. Um, so were the federal government actually pushing it? Um, I spoke before he died, I spoke to Tom Kent, who was in the Department for Regional Economic Expansion in, from 1969 to 1971, who uh, basically, I wasn't able to use it, he said, please don't use this in your thesis, but he basically intimated that yes, the federal government would love to see this, and we will do anything uh, we can to help you achieve it. But we can't actually say that. We won't say it. We won't come out and say, we think there should be a maritime unit. But the implication is there. And the rest of Canada, in terms of, if you think back to the 60s, W.A.C. Bennett in British Columbia, his five regions concept, although he was actually from New Brunswick, he used to forget about that. And he used to say, they need, this is a greater threat to Canada. The economic uh, position of this region is a greater threat to Canada than Quebec separatism, uh, he used to say. So there, there is this pressure here. Um, and I think these, uh, with the right conditions, can be key sort of shapers of cooperation. Particularly after the Maritime Union study, there was uh, great pressure to actually provide a response to it. So I, I love this cartoon. I love this cartoon from Bob Chambers in the Chronicle Herald in Halifax. Uh, published in 1970, April 1970. On, it was on the eve of a provincial election in Quebec. Uh, Quebec was going to go to the polls. There was an editorial alongside it about whether uh, René Lévesque would hold the balance of power. It wasn't suggesting he was going to win, but there may be a um, minority government in which Lévesque holds the balance of power, and the country may break apart. Now, the Chronicle Herald at that time was absolutely, totally against maritime union, any notion of it. Uh, because it's Halifax, it's Nova Scotia, we're the oldest, we're the richest, uh, that kind of position. But I thought this was quite telling at this time. Um, before, before the publication of the Maritime Union Study in November 1970, that it was sort of looking as if it was changing its tune um, on this. Um, and the depiction of NOAA with Maritime Union as the Ark, save ourselves from Quebec separatism, the tagline to this is, woe is me, the dike is breaking, build yourself an ark while there's still time. So I thought this was quite telling as to perhaps if there was ever going to be a union, and I don't really want to talk much about union because I would perhaps argue that it's never, not really achievable, but if there's ever going to be one, then this perhaps gives an indication of how and why it might happen. It would be external, it would be rapid, it would almost be sort of like a safety in numbers kind of coming together in order to protect ourselves from these external threats. And I, I, I like this photo, this cartoon because it depicts that. It gives a good uh, backdrop to the argument. So uh, some of the reasons that discourage cooperation then. Reluctance, political reluctance to cede power to regional institutions, giving away your sovereignty, giving away your authority, your jurisdiction. And uh, I always use this from, uh, from Dick Hatfield, Richard Hatfield, Premier in uh, New Brunswick, 1970 to 1987. He said politicians are not going to give up power for which they can claim credit. And economic development, although it may be the main pillar of cooperation, you can claim credit for it. You can say, look what we're doing, look what we're achieving, and politicians aren't going to give that away. And Richard Hatfield was actually one of the main supporters of union, of cooperation. Um, electoral politics as well. Premiers are responsible to define electorates um, and define territories. You obviously have to have elections within that. So you may, uh, as we would see with the Maritime Union Study, may make progress on cooperation may make progress on regionalism, and then you have an election, and then someone comes in, like Gerald Regan, who says, I want no part of this. It's all about Nova Scotia. It's all about the best deal for them. Um, and you, as Alec Campbell would say, you cash in your chips and you leave the table, or, or just don't play ball. So um, this is always one of the main things. This is why uh, the Maritime Union study tried to deal with this notion of institutionalization or delegating to some kind of central body in order to stop this kind of thing actually happening. Um, and this feeds into non-binding agreements. Um, I speak to Stephen Tomlin, who's in the department here, and he often talks about the role of accords. We'd sign accords, they're agreements, but they're not enforceable. They're not enforceable in court. Uh, you're not bound to, uh, perhaps, you're not bound to uh, keep the commitment. 
So they're just a way of actually saying, well, we've made agreement, it's off the table, we've acted, kind of thing. So, um, and Alec Campbell said again, there's always a concern that regional institutions would not survive another change of government. Uh, I think this broadly taps into the nature of intergovernmental relations within the whole Canadian system. It's not just uh, this region here. Intergovernmental relations in Canada is executive dominated. It's dominated by the premiers or cabinet level ministers. It's confederal by sovereign governments, intergovernmental sovereign governments, and underpinned by unanimity. So if PEI doesn't agree, uh, then you're not going to get agreement. Um, failure of the Senate, I say this to my students all the time and it seems to be the default answer to everything. The failure of the Senate to look after regional interests within the national parliament, within the national arena, has empowered the premiers. They're more powerful because there is no, uh, re no institution at the centre looking after uh, provincial interests effectively. The Senate was meant to do that and it hasn't and doesn't achieve that. Uh, in the same way as perhaps in the United States. Um, and also the separated party structure, the bifurcated parties that we talk about in political science, encourages competitive federalism, uh, particularly uh, within the provinces. If there's something out there that's up for grabs, something that's going to uh, help the province, then you're going to compete for it. We want it in Nova Scotia, we want it in PEI, we want it in New Brunswick, and it doesn't matter about the rest of them. Beggar thy neighbour. And if it goes wrong, then we'll shift blame to somebody else. Well, it's Nova Scotia's fault because they didn't, they didn't want to play ball on that one. So these are some of the things that I've highlighted within my research, within my PhD, that as to why uh, there is perhaps a logic to cooperation, but why it never sort of gets beyond a certain level. So I don't want to talk about too much about uh, political union, but this is just basically how I define it. The amalgamation of the four Atlantic provinces into a, a single province within the Canadian Federation. And this in itself has, has problems because I've never really looked at it in terms of Atlantic Union. I looked at it in terms of Maritime Union, which is perhaps slightly more achievable um, than the Atlantic one. But seeing they were in Newfoundland, I thought I'd bring it in and consider some uh, aspects of where Newfoundland has been as well. Proposed at a time of crisis, there's often some element of crisis, some element of uh, like Quebec separatism as to why this comes up. But I want to consider the 1960s because it was actually within the political arena. It was proposed and engaged with by the premiers themselves. Usually as we saw last year when a senator from Nova Scotia brought it up, it usually comes from people on the peripheries, whether it's business, um, who have no real sort of Influence, uh, not influence, but decision-making power over the actual process. So at this time, the three maritime premiers engaged with the political union concept in the 60s, which resulted in the study. So this is why I think it's important. The study was proposed by Louis Robichaud, 1964, September, at the Charlottetown Centennial Conference. So everybody was there to talk about how uh, great confederation was and uh, how much of a big occasion it was. This was in the 60s, so there was everybody was watching them, and he got up there and spoke about Maritime Union and said, uh, the, the process in 1864 when we discussed the union was never finished. Maybe we should get together and finish it off. Um, and at the time, there was the Atlantic Premiers Conference, which served as a forum in which to raise this again. Um, it initially included Newfoundland. Robert Shaw used to talk in Atlantic terms. He didn't just talk about the Maritimes, he, took, he spoke about the Atlantic. So it included Newfoundland, and Newfoundland was at the table in the Atlantic Premiers Conference. Um, it initially only went forward as Nova Scotia and New Brunswick until 1966 when Alex Campbell uh, was elected in PEI. And this was its uh, terms of reference in 1968. It was led by, it was a bureaucratic-led public inquiry. It wasn't a royal commission or anything like that. It was led by um, John Deutsch who was the Chancellor of Queen's University. Uh, Fred Drummy, who did most of the donkey work, who was the, uh, in the government of New Brunswick at the time, and um, someone called Fred Arsenault, who was a Deputy Minister in New Brunswick uh, 
uh, during the Hatfield years, but at this time he was just uh, an assistant to Hatfield. So it was very New Brunswick dominated as well. Uh, John Deutsch had uh, already completed uh, a report for Robbie Show. So it was, this was one of the things that perhaps stopped it as well. It was very New Brunswick dominated. And it was published in November 1970. So the external shapers for it were economic underdevelopment and dependency on the federal government. This was actually sort of a key time for recognition that this was a problem. The premiers at the time recognized that economic underdevelopment and dependency on things like equalization was becoming a problem. And maybe this would actually uh, attenuate that. Political leadership, there was this is one of the key variables that numerous reports in the years since have brought up as to why cooperation never gets very far. Leadership, there is never the leadership in which to drive it forward. At this time, begun by Robichaud, there was the leadership and there was the support for it. And I've mentioned already the rise of political officials, people like Drummy, who were within the government. So Drummy, um, after he completed the Maritime Union study, he went to be secretary of the cabinet under Regan, Gerald Regan, in Nova Scotia. So he was on the inside saying, How are you going to provide a response to this? Quebec nationalism and separatism, as I showed with the um, with the cartoon, threat of being cut off from the rest of Canada. What are we going to do if Quebec breaks away? We will be separated from the rest of Canada. Maybe this is a way to respond to that. And pressure from the rest of Canada. Um, this is a quote from Bob Stanfield uh, that he did in the 1980s in a an interview that's in the archives in New Brunswick. It's a thought that since, a lot, since the people in the rest of Canada were putting a lot of money into the Maritimes, we should explore every possibility that they thought was a good idea. And there was a lot of feeling in other parts of the country that a political union would make sense. So um, recognition there. I often wonder, and I did look a bit in my PhD at ambition, and whether Robert Stanfield at this time was considering ambition, his own ambition, what's happening with Diefenbaker, who could possibly replace him, or well, maybe I can. So maybe if I start structuring my opinions that marry up with the rest of those opinions outside of this region, but with the rest of Canada, then that maybe he might help my chances. And I did look at this in my PhD. I'm not quite sure if it's got much credence, but I thought it was an interesting line of inquiry. So it was the Maritime Union study was uh, Drummy himself said it was primarily concerned with economic issues and the cost of government governance. So economic and administrative. So he, he tried to take the sort of the political aspect out of it. Forget about Quebec, forget about these kind of questions. It's economic. We're economists concerned with the cost of government, he, he said to me. And this is one of the quotes from it. So it's the threat of slow economic growth and continued inferior level of participation in economic and political life that poses the most likely and serious challenges. So this was the main sort of way in which they approached And it was a very short, uh, a very short report. It was only about 60 pages long. Um, and it was designed primarily for politicians. It wasn't designed for the public. Um, I, I used this at the end, but I'll tell you it now. When Louis Robichaud first proposed this, Robert Stanfield said, look, Louis, Nobody is marching in the streets for maritime union. And I think that's a really good way of when people talk about, well, there's going to be, we could go public. It could be a public sort of uprising. It could be a public, we could make it a public debate. Nobody's marching in the streets for maritime union. It's a very sort of political concept designed to be considered by politicians. And there was a great debate between Deutsch and Drummy at this time about how to pitch the report. Should it be something for the public? or should it be something for politicians? And it came down on the side that it was for politicians. These politicians are going to make the decisions. They're the main players. We'll pitch it in this kind of way. So these were the conclusions. Um, they spoke about informal and formal cooperation, but they dismissed it on the basis that there was no executive authority. And this perhaps gets to the heart of one of the problems now, when we've got cooperation, whether it is formal or informal. There's no executive authority. Um, it's channeled directly through the premiers. There's no, they propose something called a Maritime Provinces Commission, sort of sim, on a similar sort of institutional level as perhaps like the EU's got its three pillars. And this was going to be the initiating body that would initiate cooperation and then the premiers would uh, come in at that level. 
also produced some form of union, economic, administrative, economic, and full political. And it concluded that only full political union would bring about the right machinery, the right, uh, and the attainment of the objectives. So it came down on full political union achieved over a period of 10 years uh, with a, a reassessment after five years of the process. So the response of the premiers to this was, uh, they actually said they accepted. We accept um, all, all the, uh, the conclusions, but they rejected political union. So I thought it was quite important to put that the federal government supported the maritime union study with half their actual budget. So it showed where the federal government was thinking at this time. It was something that the federal government could perhaps support. Um, but it became preoccupied with the October crisis. So it was published in November 1970. There was still the October crisis sort of going on at this time. The federal government was too preoccupied with that to actually uh, really bother or care about this, but to pay too much attention, to put pressure for a response. Two new political leaders, Richard Hatfield and Gerald Regan, were elected in October 1970. The rest of Canada did expect a response. But as Stephen Tomlin said in his book, uh, having this, the Council of Maritime Premiers as the response allowed the premiers to keep control of the process. They could present a united front to the federal government and say, look, we're acting. We're acting on the report. But it allowed them to control the nature and the pace of change. And this is sort of the institution that we still have today, albeit with Newfoundland in it, as the Council of Atlantic Premiers. So there has been some success. The Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission is often held up as being one. But there's no agreement in sensitive areas. Things like energy, those kind of politically sensitive areas, perhaps those even in economic development, like Hatfield said. Um, so no agreement in energy. Uh, and Gerald Regan said it, he said this in, in the early 1970s, integrative efforts to date have not seriously challenged the political process. And I'd argue that that's really still the case today. We're still not challenging the political process. And provincial competition remained. And this is what uh, Regan said to me when I interviewed him in 2010. We only pursued it when it was in the best deal for the taxpayer. For the Nova Scotian taxpayer, we'd pursue cooperation. We never went into the election in October 1970 with any kind of regional agenda or, or regional plan. It was all about the province. Um, so the role of Newfoundland, it's traditionally taken an external approach to intergovernmental relations. And when I mean that, it's about its relationship perhaps with the federal government. Um, so it did, it did engage the Atlantic Premier's Conference in 1956 and the annual Premier's Conference as a way to achieve its objectives over things like Term 29. Um, but once that process uh, had concluded, or once the objectives had been achieved, it withdrew. It withdrew from the Atlantic Premier's Conference. And Smallwood stopped, uh, stopped attending the annual Premier's Conference in the early 1960s. I, I looked at his papers in the archives here, and he said, um, he said, there's, there's no, no reason to attend. You know, there's, there's nothing on the table. What's the point, you know, what's, what's the point in just sitting around kind of talking um, when there's nothing on the table? Nothing to be gained out of it. So, and I spoke to Ed Roberts as well, and that was his general sentiments uh, about that. So, but from the 1960s, the Maritimes, they were using cooperation as a mechanism for sort of internal economic objectives. It became a lot more internalized about how are we now going to help ourselves? Perhaps we should look at union. Perhaps we should look at this and look at that. So Newfoundland generally uh, rode, back at, uh, rode back from it at this point. I spoke to Clyde Wells since I've been here. He came and spoke to one of my classes. Um, and I asked him about sort of his, his uh, attitude to cooperation when he was premier in the late 80s and 90s. And he, he basically brought Newfoundland back into the process. Why? And I said, why, why did you bring them back in? What, did you, what benefit did you see? What, what was your reasoning for it? So administrative savings, he said. It can bring administrative savings. We have a fair amount in common. We can provide mutual support to each other. But it's driven by issues of the time and interest of the provinces in those issues. So it's very issue-based. Um, but at the same time, he said, I recognize the difficulties of including Newfoundland in this process. It complicates it, but during his time, he thought it was the place that they should be cooperating. 
I've since thought about this, and I thought, well, that perhaps ties in more to Clydewell's sort of perspective about federalism more broadly. It took a lot more of a sort of, a, not a sort of a, a detached kind of view, and obviously the, the view of Peckford during 1982, he supported Quebec. Um, and I, I watched when Clyde Wells came into my class to talk about the Senate, talk about Canadian institutions. I, I, I could see that cooperation was perhaps consistent with his uh, view of federalism. So these are some of the recent initiatives. Uh, I went on the website to see what, what the Council of Atlantic Premiers are doing at the moment. They've recently gone for a trade mission to Brazil in October 2013 to look at business opportunities and post-secondary education opportunities. But I thought this was quite interesting because when this uh, mission was planned, then there was an election in Nova Scotia. Daryl Dexter got uh, ousted. So Daryl Dexter went on this even though he was no longer Premier. Stephen McNeil, as Premier uh, designate, asked Daryl Dexter to go on his behalf. So I wonder then how sort of the electoral politics play out here. What could uh, Daryl Dexter agree to if he didn't actually have the power anymore? And employment insurance. So they've set up a task force to look at ins employment insurance changes that the federal government's making, and they're going to sort of lobby the federal government as a, a collective. And the report was due back on the 15th of October, but I can't see uh, whether it's back or not yet. It doesn't seem to be, so it, that's delayed. So today then, um, I spoke to Roger Gibbons a few years ago, who was uh, the director of the Canada West Foundation in Calgary. And he expressed that cooperation in the Maritimes has now been overtaken by endeavours in Western Canada. They've overtaken, they're doing a lot more in terms of cooperation than the Maritimes are. And there's this thing now called the New West Partnership Trade Agreement. Uh, previously TILMA, the Trade Industry Labour Mobility Agreement. The New West Partnership is between um, BC, Alberta and Saskatchewan. And it's basically a free trade, allow the free movement of people, goods, uh, marrying up regulations in the provinces and allowing businesses to, um, to do business a lot easier without barriers and regulation. And Donald Savoy has said that having Newfoundland in the mix has made it extremely difficult for the region to do much beyond forming a lobby group. So this is just, uh, just some things as to what the New West Partnership Agreement is. Barrier-free interprovincial market, mutual recognition um, of rules, and free movement of goods and services. And I, I, I often think, is this where the Maritimes or where Atlantic Canada should be? Should we be uh, pursuing this kind of thing? And then I look back at the documents from the 90s. There was meant to be something called Maritime Economic Union in the early 90s. Um, and I asked Stephen Tomlin, I looked at the documents, and I couldn't find out actually what happened to it. What, what came of that process? The only thing that I can think of is the overall agreement with the Canadian provinces in 1994, the agreement on internal trade, perhaps superseded that. But I can't find... So the Maritimes have been thinking along these lines, um, but it never actually uh, came to anything from what I can see. If someone can set me straight, then there. So it's regional in scope, the new West Agreement, uh, any province or territory, but it can expand. There is scope for it to expand to become a, perhaps a, an all-encompassing provincial agreement, um, and even the federal government can join. So it's meant to, to expand on the agreement on internal trade, it's still executive dominated though. Administration is by a, uh, a ministerial committee in which a cabinet level representative is uh, appointed on behalf of the, the provincial government. But there is a, an administrator who's there to uh, dispute, dispute resolution and administrative support. So there is sort of a level of institutionalization there. They've got a secretariat and you can't just ca as I say, cash in your chips. Withdrawal requires 12 months written notice. So it prevents, prevents this sudden withdrawal just leaving the table. <coughs> and there was an article published by Professor Chris Dunn in the department here in Policy Options in 2012, where he calls for this new east, calls for the formation of a new east out of the Atlantic provinces in Quebec. There's always a bit, already a bit of cooperation going on between these in terms of uh, what they do with the New England governors. 
<coughs> and he said it should be a new organization to pursue these big ticket policies, as he says. The policies which we've really failed to tackle uh, over the years as it stands. So energy, transportation, trade, labor, mobility, which is what the New West does, uh, Aboriginal affairs, with a permanent level of institutionalization. So mandated inclusion, written rules and procedures, and a permanent secretariat. So a lot more institutionalized um, and deals with these issues like unanimity uh, to stop uh, one province perhaps scuppering the whole process. So um, I take this and, offer, and I ask myself, is this where we should be going? But is it actually achievable? You know, we've had cooperation in this region for nearly 50 years, for over 50 years, and we still haven't got to this. So uh, last year, this time last year, about this time last year, uh, Senator Stephen Green of Nova Scotia said, uh, we should have a maritime union, he said. And the media went a bit crazy about it, particularly the central Canadian media, the Globe and Mail, John Ibbotson, he had a few articles on it, that there should be a maritime union now. And um, he was supported by uh, two senators. I can't remember the, who the one from New Brunswick was, but the one from PEI was Mike Duffy. So he's slightly uh, been slightly taken off track since then by more pressing matters. Um, so he said it should be a public movement. So this is where the nobody's marching in the streets. Comes favorable response from Central Canada, um, where John Ibbotson asked, the maritime provinces are broke. If union is not the answer, then what is? And the, the movement or the process sort of died out. I contacted Stephen Green. I heard back from him. I said, look, I've done this research. You know, if you want any uh, insight or, you know, I, you can have my PhD, you can have my abstract. He said, we're forming a Facebook group. We're forming a Facebook group about maritime union. Um, and it still hasn't materialized, so I'm not quite sure what's happened. It's probably just petered out. But it was interesting. It was interesting to see how the debate, you know, it's almost like sort of Groundhog Day deja vu. We're having this debate again um, that we've had for the last however many years. But it, it petered out because there was no political support amongst the premiers. This was outside of the political arena, outside of the corridors of power. So. Uh, there was nowhere really for it to go. And then I pulled this off, uh, a quote from Robert Gears, current Premier PEI, because I just thought that this just sums it all up. He says, there's a great deal amount of cooperation. We've got the Atlantic Lottery Corporation. This is a great example of cooperation. Well, yes, it, it may make whoever wins the lottery a bit richer, but does it actually challenge, does it deal with any of the issues that cooperation is sort of was designed to deal with or meant to deal with. Um, so, so my conclusions then. I, it's un, cooperation has been undermined by its ad hoc and executive nature. Um, unanimity and non-binding agreements, without the executive authority, perhaps without a, 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 an institution, this Maritime Provinces Commission that was proposed by the Maritime Union Study, institutions are going to be ineffective. You know. You're talking to three premiers, who's the boss, who's in charge. It's very difficult to get agreement. Uh, premiers are always going to be reluctant to de delegate the power. But I still think the logic of cooperation in this region has always been present. It's always, it's sort of ever present. There's a willingness to cooperate. But it not entirely sure in what we're cooperating on or what we're cooperating for. It's always made sense from an administrative economic perspective, economic union perhaps, but it hasn't been reconciled politically. Uh, political will and leadership remain the key variables. Leadership is always the one that comes out in conclusions to reports. The, the report by Charles Macmillan in 1991, Standing Up for the Future, which was meant to reassess cooperation. This was the main conclusion, leadership. We need this leadership. And uh, it's doesn't seem to be forthcoming. So vision or hallucination. So the will to cooperate is present, yet the scope remains limited. Still economically focused and do not challenge political jurisdiction. But it's undermined by the reality of politics. And I've posed this question at the end because it ties into some, to some research that you may be interested in that Stephen Tomlin's doing at the moment. Uh, are international alliances becoming more important? 
So the New England governors and Eastern Canadian premiers is cooperation that's been going on for almost as long as the Council of Maritime Premiers. Is this becoming more important now when we think about perhaps energy, uh, energy into New England? Alec Campbell said in the 1980s, this was one step too far for cooperation. I always felt that did you really need the premier to be turning up to this? Surely you could have just sent a minister. But um, there's some ongoing research about that, so maybe that says a bit more about uh, where the process is going. Thank you very much.